In 2011, the port of Antwerp realized they had a small problem. Shipping containers were going missing. They'd come off the boat, be loaded into the yard, and then a truck driver would turn up to pick it up, and the container would be gone. The containers didn't contain anything particularly valuable. It was things like lumber, tires, bananas that were going missing. And it didn't become evident until last year why they were going missing. A truck driver um, picked up his container from the port, was driving to the destination, and he got ambushed by a gang brandishing AK-47s who shot at him. Luckily, he was uninjured. It turned out drug smuggling gangs had been breaking into the shipping containers of other people, hiding their drugs in it, and using that to get it across borders. It turns out that the same globalizing effects that shipping containers have given us, that 90% of trade happens through containers, also have the same benefits for uh, illegal activities. As the Stockholm Institute for Peaceful Research says, containerization provides traffic, trafficking and proliferation networks with the same cost and time-saving transport mechanisms that have allowed the world's multinational companies to deliver their products quickly and cheaply, penetrate new markets, and expand their global customer base. The containers act as a, a nice abstraction. They're a single standardized shape. Um, shipping companies can treat each container identically regardless of contents. Um, but I realized that I didn't understand how shipping worked. It's a system that I rely on for all the goods that I need. So I built a thing to understand. This is a little printer publication called Little Emma. What it does is every day it prints out the location of the Emma Maersk. At the time, the Emma Maersk was the largest container ship in the world. It's a tiny piece of information every day, um, and it doesn't seem very significant by itself. But seeing it every day, it incrementally builds up my knowledge of how the shipping container network works. Because it's a network, I can't fully understand how it works by looking at the box, by looking at the ship, by looking at the individual objects. I can only understand by seeing the flow over time, how it changes over time. Using this, I kind of gain the familiarity with the network. I kind of understand the places that it involves, of Yuntian, of uh, the Strait of Malacus, of the Suez Canal, of Felixstowe, and of Antwerp. Which brings me back to how these gangs figured out where these containers were in order to steal them. Uh, each container has a unique tracking ID, and this is the only indication you have on the outside of the container of what it is. Everything else is held in software, all the metadata about the container, what it contains, where it's going, who it belongs to, where it's previously been, where it's going next. And what these gangs were doing was hacking into the control computers of the port of Antwerp to figure out where the containers were, change the shipping manifests so that their truck drivers could go in, pretend to be the intended recipient, and pick it up before the real driver got there. Um, the, the network, uh, the fact that it can only be understood through flow, feels a bit like the early computer memory systems. This is a delay line memory. Um, this is before we stored information on hard drives and computers in the form of magnetic field. The way it would work is these were tubes of mercury, and on one side was a speaker, on one side was a microphone. Each bit of information we transmitted into the speaker would form a ripple across the mercury, which would flow from one side to the other, and would be picked up by the microphone on the other side. It let you store information for a few milliseconds, as long as it took the wave to hit the other side. And by hooking the microphone back up to the speaker, the wave would keep going forever, as long as you kept it powered on. The memory would only be held by the computer. The computer would only work whilst the information was in flow. And the container network is similar to this. It only exists in flow. Anyway, these gangs, they uh, initially hacked the computers of the port of Antwerp by emailing malware. Um, this would let them hijack the control systems and see where the containers were going. Um, but the port kind of caught on to this. They installed firewalls, they installed an antivirus software. So the gangs stepped it up. They broke into the offices physically and installed physical key logging hardware. Small computers hidden around the office in power um, extension cables, in fake hard drives, all the normal detritus you see in an office. And these tiny computers would log the information, let them log in remotely and manipulate the information. Um, 
they were essentially the same kind of small, cheap computers like the Raspberry Pi that we use in kind of hobbyist activities. Um, this is kind of access, um, this is allowing control of physical infrastructure using software and cheap, affordable access to hardware is what Chris Anderson refers to as the new industrial revolution. It's the maker movement. It's the same thing we do as a hobby. Um, this probably wasn't and what Anderson was uh, expecting us to do with this technology, though. He probably expected kind of hobbyists and people that are entrepreneurs to create these, uh, not uh, criminals. <laughs> I should probably clarify that um, Chris Anderson, who wrote the book Makers, is the Chris Anderson who's the former editor of Wired, not the Chris Anderson who runs TED conferences. And that his book Makers should not be confused by the other book Makers by Cory Doctorow. Here's a real disambiguation problem, it seems. Anyway, um, I saw him speak about this, and he gives a really good, uh, exciting introduction to the topic. It gets you really fired up about all the possibilities of this uh, accessible infrastructure. He spoke about his company that makes uh, uh, UAV kits. Um, and he was talking about the difficulty of finding motors. He was having problems finding the right specification motor at the right price. So he used Alibaba, the online marketplace, which is kind of like eBay, but you buy direct from the factory. Um, it's got this wonderful live chat feature where you can chat with the factories and ask for things made to a specific specification. So he got these motors custom made to the specification that he needed and got them shipped to himself. And he describes it as robots in China working for him. He had point and click interaction with the manufacturing capability at whatever scale he wanted. He also goes on to describe Shapeways and Pinoco, these online services where you can get uh, objects laser cut and 3D printed on demand. You submit a design on a website and a box arrives with the physical stuff you wanted to make. And I'm a software developer and this sounded brilliant to me. I thought I could write software and it could make physical things and I could leave it running and it would be its own autonomous company that would make me profit. Anytime someone wanted a physical thing made, this would do it all on my behalf. So I started trying to prototype it. Um, I went to London Hackspace, a brilliant workshop that has all the tools you need. It has lathes, CNCs, 3D printers, automated knitting machines, laser cutters, and helpful people who will help uh, teach you how to use these machines, which is the most important part. Um, their 3D printer, by the way, is always broken. It turns out consumer 3D printers are really rubbish. Um, this is Brendan Dawes' Tumblr, where he photographs everything he makes on his MakerBot. But he's considering renaming the blog to everything, with my, everything I make with my MakerBot when I'm not taking it apart to fix it. So I went with laser cutting instead. <clears throat> uh, and I took an old project I built because I, I just wanted to get started quickly. Um, this is a really old thing. It takes data from Doppler, which is the thing Nokia shut down last year, that you should tell your friends where you're traveling. And it would... Uh, show you on a map where it was. And this is the Dimaxion map projection. It's a wonderful projection that reduces distortion when turning uh, the map of the world from a sphere into a flat surface. It does this by turning the sphere into an isosahedron, and then it kind of pulls apart the triangles to make a flattened surface. This has the brilliant advantage that you can do it the other way around. So you could print out this visualization, cut it up, glue it together, fold it, and you've got a physical memento of your travel history. Um, which is kind of like Internet of Things 101 product, take digital data, make physical souvenir. Um, so I decided to make it out of wood instead of paper to make it a bit more durable. And so this is the first draft. And it's not very good. There are a number of problems with this. The process of laser cutting is basically burning wood selectively. So when you've got a lot of things really close together, like country borders and islands, um, the wood heats up and catches fire. You can see scorch marks. Uh, in the center. Um, the other problem is the data file. The uh, land masses of the world was too large for the memory of a laser cutter to hold. Australia is missing. Southeast Asia is missing. Antarctica is missing. Um, and there's all sorts of scorching and burning around the edges. It's a bit rubbish. Um, I mean, I got to the difficulty of how to plug it all together. I had to go away and read woodworking books to learn how to make joins. It turns out no one's made a book of what woodworking joins work best for laser cutting. The best guide I found was a thing called the Dome Book from the 1960s. It's this amazing publication. It's like an early form of a wiki. The way it worked is everyone who built geodesic domes 
which have similar instructions to this, would mail in their plans, tips, advice, all the problems they encountered. And all of these articles would get glued together and photocopied into a zine and sent out. I mean, everyone would give it a try and mail back all the adjustments and changes, and it would kind of increase in versions and improve over time. So it has the best advice on how to try and stick triangles together without them falling apart. Um, and it turns out to be a very labor-intensive process and a very unpleasant process. It generates a lot of dust, um, which is unpleasant to breathe. It smells terrible. The smell of burnt uh, glue in the MDF is deeply unpleasant. It took about three days to wash it out of my hair, um, which is about the point when I gave up, when I realized how difficult it was. Um, as a software developer, I was quite naive about how difficult making physical things is. Brian Boyer de describes all of this as a matter battle. A matter battle is the conflict between human intentions and the laws and behaviors of the physical universe. He goes on, matter battles generally involve actions for which undo cost a lot of time, money, or both. This is because matter tends to exhibit characteristics such as heaviness, largeness, crumbliness, and wieldiness. In most cases, matter is not self-healing and does not have a naive ability to regenerate, therefore resulting in a situation where mistakes tend to turn a piece of matter into useless scrap. Frequently, I'd find myself drilling boxes to precision specifications for a day, make one tiny mistake, and the day's work is gone. In software development, I just press the undo button. It's a very different process. Most people who read this blog post are already used to working, perhaps even living in the digital, but the matter battle described above might seem overhyped. This is because we've tricked ourselves into thinking that we've mastered the material world. To some extent, we have. We've been to the bottom of the ocean and the top of the heavens. Yet putting things together or taking them apart rarely goes according to plan. I wish I'd read this before making things. Um, Cory Doctorow's bookmakers uh, offers a very different narrative to um, Chris Anderson's one. Chris Anderson doesn't mention the difficulty of making physical things at all. His entire point is to get us excited, to sell the vision that we can build a new generation of entrepreneurs making new manufactured goods. Cory Doctorow is a fiction writer. He doesn't have this need to sell a vision, to sell business books. So he can be a bit more realistic in his depiction. In this book, making physical things becomes easy and commonplace and it becomes the exciting new thing to do. So loads of people start their startups doing this. And then this huge boom begins, and everyone kind of tries it. People quit their jobs, they buy leftover space and malls to do it. And yet, it all goes horribly wrong. It turns out nobody can figure out a business model for this. The boom goes bust, everyone's left unemployed. Which might be the more realistic depiction of what's gonna happen. Um, Tim Marley has a brilliant article in Wired where he describes the uh, making process of shapeways who manufacture 3D goods. He describes two things, how dusty the place is and how much labor is involved. There's loads of people involved in the process of 3D printing. There's someone that checks the designs works, there's someone that tessellates them together into a print bed, there's someone who dusts them off, there's someone who polishes them, people pack them into boxes. It's a very labor-intensive process. So when Chris Anderson says robots in China made his custom motors, it's likely that those robots are made out of meat. They're people. Um, they're just working in a very automated fashion. And because they're behind a screen, because they're behind that point-and-click interface, it feels automated. And you see blog posts like this, um, how I automated the boring parts of my life, and you read it. And this person had not automated anything. They've outsourced it to other people, which is a very different thing. So the process of software development is uh, a process of creating abstractions. It's much easier for me to make physical things now because it's abstracted behind uh, code libraries. And abstractions are quite useful. Um, they help us make things easier. Uh, if we had to think of everything we do without the abstractions, it'd be quite an exhausting process. Uh, this is a YouTube comment about uh, manufactured normalcy field. Uh, this person says, in reality, I'm staring at a flat panel made of superheated sand that is connected by strips of ores and really heavily processed dinosaur remains to a thing that we all pretend to understand called the internet. Also, I'm sitting on cow skin painted black and stapled on some processed dinosaur remains. I think it's weird how much ancient animal matter is still being used to make everything we do possible. Thanks, Stegosaurus. <clears throat> and so, as a software developer, what I'm doing when I'm abstracting is concealing things. 
Um, to describe an algorithm, it's a word used by programmers when they do not want to explain what they did, uh, which I do a lot because I'm lazy. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes this abstraction process has pr uh, adverse side effects. This is the Renew Recycling Bin you'll find in the city of London. Um, it's a specially designed bin for the age of terrorism. Uh, it's designed to be bomb-proof. It contains the uh, blast of a pipe bomb uh, and reduces injuries, but it's very expensive to build, which means it needs a business model to support it. Um, so Renew, the company that make it, don't see themselves as a refuse collection company. They see themselves as a content marketing company. They make live news, uh, live tube updates, Twitter debates appear on these digital screens on the side of the bin and run adverts alongside it. And it turns out they also decided to copy other things from the internet, like tracking cookies. It turns out their bins were tracking all Wi-Fi devices that passed by, which led to ridiculous diagrams like this recycling bins with screens and tracking devices. Um, it led to the City of London uh, recycling division dealing with data privacy concerns rather than collecting refuse. Uh, then they issued statements that were a bit tone deaf with ominous headlines like statement regarding orb technology. Some people defended their actions in surveilling the people walking past their bins. This publication said, secondly, Renew hardly conducted the trials in secret. It issues not one, but two press releases about what it was doing, neither of which got any coverage at the time. Because we all read the press releases of the street furniture we walk past. <laughs> James Bridle describes this as the result of the network's inherent illegibility, its tendency towards seamlessness and invisibility from code to the cloud. Those who cannot perceive the network cannot act effectively within it and are powerless. The job, then, is to make such things visible. He's talking about drones, but it equally applies to rubbish bins, it turns out, which is why he's been chalking warning signs onto the rubbish bins around London. And then the technologist Tom Taylor has reverse engineered how their technology works and has written up advice on how to avoid these bins surveilling you and how to make a jamming device which would render their data useless. Luckily, the city of London stepped in and told them to stop doing this with the bins. Um, and the company has since gone into administration. Uh, the bins just sit useless, broken, sitting around London. Except the bin looks the same when it's surveilling you and when it's not. It's completely obscure the way it behaves. And they're really not very good as bins. <laughs> like, they're rubbish at collecting rubbish. Um, they've kind of gone on this massive tangent designing uh, monitoring algorithms, advertising screens, that they've forgotten the simple bit of making it easy to collect refuse. <clears throat> when we see things like uh, Minority Report, uh, the way the technology works, the surveillance technology, is made to be very legible. Uh, you can see in the film wh who's being scanned, when it's being scanned. It's all very clear. It's in the filmmaker's interest to make sure we, as the viewer, understand what is going on. In reality, it's not like this. This is the similar Wi-Fi tracking system used by retailers. And the retailer says, it would be probably better not to use the tracking system at all if we had to let people know about it. Um, so this system is used for tracking people looking at adverts, tracking you going around shops. And it turns out it's used by the Canadian Security Agency to track everyone entering an airport and then look back where they go before and after the airport, which bars, cafes, shops they go to. Um, the same technology can be applied for surveillance and retail. The uh, artist Julian Oliver um, created the Critical Engineering Manifesto. It's a way of describing the way that Tom Taylor worked to uh, render the way this technology works and influences us legible. <clears throat> Which is probably valuable considering how naive many of us are about technology. This is the British Prime Minister justifying surveillance, uh, the electronic dragnet surveillance currently. I love watching crime dramas on the television, as I should probably stop telling people. There is hardly a crime drama that is not solved without using the data of a telecommunications device. But I'm sure we know that CSI doesn't depict technology in the most accurate light. We need to build tools for people to understand technology better. Um, those in power should probably understand how these things work, not be able to code, but be able to understand how machines work. Um, this is the a uh, member of the parliament responsible for overseeing GCHQ, the British Electronic Surveillance Agency, who admits to being completely clueless to how any of this works. And as um, Nick Saver writes in response to uh, Ian Bogost's um, reverse engineering of Netflix uh, genres, 
Uh, as Nicholas Dipriere has written, reverse engineering can be used for a way to figure out what obscure technologies do. It cannot get us answers to the question of why. These obscure technologies are constantly refined. We need better ways to talk about the whys and hows of engineering as a practice. Critical engineering can only show us how. We must go on to ask the why. For example, when Eric Schmidt, of CEO of Google, says that he would quite like a private island somewhere free from regulation where he can try out anything he wants, we should probably ask, what is the motive of Google? What does Google want? Why does it want us to sign up to Google Plus? And I've seen this film before, where a, a billionaire hires lots of engineers, gets his own private island to try out the new technology he wants to do. And it doesn't end well. Um, as Jeff Goldblum's character in the film said, God help us, we're in the hands of engineers. Thank you. Uh, so one or two questions from the, from the stream. Um, one of them is about this um, critical engineering manifesto. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's your perspective on how artists um, or designers uh, try to, well, uh, address those questions in their work. Do you have, do you have any comments or examples on that? Um, I'm just very fond of uh, Julian Oliver and the other two whose names I don't remember's work uh, in this area. Um, they use the artistic practice as a way of doing things which would normally be illegal for an engineer to do. For example, one of their latest pieces, um, whose name I can't remember, is a uh, GSM mobile phone jamming device. They've taken a toy model tank and fitted a, a GSM jamming device, which jams mobile phones nearby. And it's a little remote control thing you can drive around, so you could drive it around this conference and it would block everyone's phones nearby it. And they can only do this because they kind of can call it art. If you did this without being able to call it art, you'd be arrested because it's uh, a clearly illegal activity. So it's a good way of bringing light to these issues and having the uh, ability to defend it using a large institution like an art gallery. A second question, which is maybe a bit more difficult, is how you as a software developer will try to yeah, make sense of the world in this algorithmic culture problems. How do you try to fight against those, those trends? <laughs> um, it's much the same way as anyone else. It's kind of a simple process of actually asking a question. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't have to be for software development. Um, so as an example, recently, uh, the Telegraph newspaper reported that at the G8 summit, the British Prime Minister gave USB keys of the best British music to all the other um, national leaders. And this was a few days after it had been revealed that GCHQ had been hacking other leaders at these G8 summits. And I don't know if you would trust a USB key from David Cameron not to contain malware. Um, so I submitted a freedom of information request to Downing Street asking for the contents of this USB key. And it's a simple process. You write a letter, and someone replies to it with the information. And there's no technological need. Um, it, there's no technological capability in the request. Um, it's just simply asking a question, which anyone could do. Um, and for some reason, they replied with a Spotify playlist to me, which was quite nice. Uh, and then the next day, it was on the page three of the independent newspaper and featured in lots of publications. And that's a simple thing anyone can do. It's open to anyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.